Hello everybody, today's episode is a really special one for me and that's because it is one of the many videos I created in my course. This is a course launching next month on holistic hypertension, how to heal the root causes of your high blood pressure. And so this particular video is dissecting salt. I wanted to make it clear for you who actually needs to worry about salt. Is this something that we all need to care about or is this, like a lot of recommendations, something that's just really outdated that we have not gotten rid of for whatever reason? And um, hint, hint, no, not everyone has to lower salt in their diet. So in this video, I am going to go over that for you. As part of the actual course, there's slides that people will get that have many more details on them. So the videos are an audio version of the content, but usually a simplified version. So you can listen to what I have to say, you can read what I have to say. There's many different versions of the information. So however you like to consume content. If this course content really resonates with you, you can get on the wait list. We're gonna accept the first cohort of my course at the beginning of next month. So if you wanna get notified about when that launches, it's on my website already as a sign up list. And yeah, I'm very excited to show you one of the videos that I made for my course. So I'm not gonna take up any more time with the intro. Let's get into it. One of the most pervasive recommendations when it comes to high blood pressure is to reduce your salt intake. But is this something you actually need to worry about? There are a lot of these old school recommendations that have since been debunked, yet they persist in our guidelines. So I wanted to ask the question, is salt the same? Is it like saturated fat, for example, where it's not actually an issue, it's just an old recommendation that never got updated. And so today I'm gonna go over for you what is salt doing in the body? If salt is an issue, how much salt is too much salt so that you can really decide whether or not you should care about this. The first thing you should note about salt though is that it is an essential mineral inside the body. We also call it sodium. It is used for fluid regulation inside the body, signal transduction inside of our nervous system, muscle contractions, it's used for a lot of things inside the body. But part of the problem is some of these modern day eating habits get us to have a lot more salt than we used to have. So a good example of this is ultra processed foods. Our daily recommendations for salt range between 1500 milligrams to 2300 milligrams of salt a day, which works out to roughly a little bit more than a teaspoon a day not a tablespoon, a teaspoon a day. And so something like a McDonald's large fries would have about 400 milligrams of sodium, AKA salt inside of it. So that's nearly a quarter of your daily recommendations with one cup of fries. If you go to something like a Chunky's Campbell soup, it has even more closer to 750 milligrams. So that's nearly half of your daily intake in one can of soup. But again, we're talking about people who are eating a lot of these ultra processed foods that use salt to flavor it and to preserve it a lot of the time. So those are just a couple examples of how much salt can be found in particular foods, but it still begs the question of whether or not this is something you actually have to track. And like anything in medicine, unfortunately, the answer is not super black and white. It does depend on the person. So two categories of people who might want to care about salt are the people who are genetically salt sensitive or those with kidney inflammation. So having troubles processing salt because that's what happens in the kidneys. If we go to the genetic people, so one of the companies I use called DNA Labs, they'll run some of these specific markers that pertain to salt sensitivity. For example, genetic variations in our ACE enzyme could make you more salt sensitive. You may recognize that enzyme from when I discussed medications. The most popular blood pressure medication targets that same enzyme, and it has a role in producing something called angiotensin II, which causes our blood vessels to constrict and drive our blood pressure up. And it has a role with salt regulation. 
So if you're one of those people who has that genetic variation, you might be more salt sensitive. People who do fit in this category are recommended to take under 1500 milligrams a day. So on the low end of that daily recommendations from ages 15 to 50. Once you get a little bit older, let me just check this quickly. From 51 to 70, they recommend you stay below 1300 milligrams. And once you're above the age of 71, they want you to keep it even lower to 1200 milligrams a day. Now again, 1500 milligrams is roughly two thirds of a teaspoon. So that's not a ton of salt in a day. And the only way to truly know is to run those genetic tests, or you could try hitting those requirements and seeing what happens. If you don't wanna cough up for that expensive genetic test, perhaps you could just play a little experiment, try dropping your salt and watching your blood pressure to see if anything happens. Because again, not everyone who does that is gonna notice a drop in their blood pressure, unfortunately. And I guess it's fortunate in the sense that you can be a little bit more liberal with your salt intake, but it's unfortunate in the sense that you're gonna to have to look elsewhere. Now again, it's not just the people with this genetic variation that should care. People with kidney inflammation and kidney disease also should pay attention to their salt intake. And it's a big reason why as we get older, we are more likely to become salt sensitive because a lot of us have our kidneys beat up through age and various different reasons. And so I'll list some of the overt kidney diseases for you here so you can reference them. But for those of us who don't have overt kidney disease, there's still important markers that you can look at to assess the health of your kidneys. Your kidneys and your blood pressure are so intimately connected. So regardless of the salt conversation, this is something we should all have looked at because Poor kidney function can drive up blood pressure and bad blood pressure can damage our kidneys. So it goes both ways. There are a couple markers that are very good at looking at the kidneys. And so I encourage all of you to have these done. And if you've had recent blood work, now you can reference back to that and see which of these markers was actually looking at your kidney function. So I'll just list a couple of them off for you. So in the blood, we can measure things like cystatin C, this is actually the gold standard and it's a really good test, but it's rarely done. You can do things like GFR, which is glomular filtration rate. You can do blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, albumin. Those are kind of the main ones in the blood. You can do urine studies that will look at your analysis. They're looking for blood and things like that. They do a macroscopic urinalysis and a microscopic urinalysis. And again, they're just measuring your urine to look for some of these kidney markers and a urine albumin creatinine ratio. Sometimes they'll do imaging like ultrasound, CT or MRI. And lastly, they can sometimes do biopsies of the kidney if they really suspect something like an autoimmune attack of your kidney. So again, these are all just various different ways to look at your kidney health. Typically they're gonna run things in the blood and in the urine first, and only if those are shining red flags, then they'll do the imaging. So I'm not saying all of you need to have your kidneys ultrasounded, but if you do show up with some of these markers indicating that your kidney function is down or your kidneys are infected or whatever, please have that further looked into because kidney health, again, is really important. And if your kidney function is declined, then you will want to pay a little bit more attention to your salt intake. And the last thing I need to mention in the context of salt is its relationship to potassium, because some studies are coming out now and saying that a low potassium diet exasperates the effects of salt, the negative effects of salt on blood pressure. So it might not be just about lowering salt, but balancing the salt out with potassium. And potassium is found in a lot of our fruits, vegetables, nuts, meats, whole foods in general tend to have a lot of potassium in them. So what this could mean is that a lot of these studies that looked at high salt in the diet, eating a lot of these ultra processed foods and found that it drived blood pressure up 
are kind of backstepping now and saying it might actually be because in that same diet, they tend to not be having a lot of these whole foods, making them relatively very low in potassium. This would just mean that sometimes you can offset the need to really focus on salt by increasing potassium in the diet. Some people will supplement with potassium. I rarely do that. I try and get it through whole foods because I think it's very realistic to get through whole foods and it's not like you need equal amounts of potassium to salt but a lot of our diet habits can neglect potassium and increase salt. And so it's really more just about incorporating more whole foods. And the very last thing I need to mention, because this is something that'll likely get asked, is are electrolytes okay? Because electrolytes should be salt-based. They're trying to replenish a lot of these essential minerals with salt being the dominant one. As I said, salt's actually very important inside the body and you definitely don't want too little of it either. And so there's this new wave trending of people taking electrolytes. And I actually don't have any problems with electrolytes. There's a couple brands I think are way above the rest because electrolytes can just be like sugar drinks if they're a bad electrolyte. So some of the companies I really like are things like LMNT, Noon, Liquid IV, Relight, and there's a couple other brands, but they are very simple formulas. They don't have a lot of added sugar and things like that, but they are dominantly sodium. And so what I would just say to keep it simple for people is it's likely only necessary to take an electrolyte to replenish your sodium and your minerals if you are doing something that requiring a ton of sweat. We don't lose a lot of sodium with just gentle exercise or anything like that. But if you're doing like a hot yoga class, if you're doing saunas, if you're doing something that does cause you to sweat a lot, then you can start to see that people enter the low electrolyte realm. And in those days, then you could supplement with an electrolyte. But again, if you're salt sensitive, probably best to avoid in general because I have seen it where electrolytes are actually triggering high blood pressure if someone's really, really sensitive. So I hope you guys found that interesting. Of course, there's likely going to be some questions, which is what those weekly check-ins will be about if you have questions around these things. But loosely speaking, this is what I think is the necessary information around salt. So we're going to see you in the next section uh, that wraps up the nutritional section for now. There will be additional information in the resources for you to reference, but that's all I have to say about salt.